morning, everybody. And it's, uh, it was great to see uh, Dr. Gibson and, and Dr. Sipa, and, and um, uh, obviously, um, what, what you're seeing from them and what you're hearing from them is is, is many years of experience, and and uh, and that of course is important to see where people can get to, where you can get to with endoscopy. Uh, but we also have to start from the beginning. So this talk is going to be a lot more like. Um, uh, crawling, okay, instead of uh, and, and a little bit of walking, and then we'll, we'll move on to running later on uh, this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, two basic approaches that I think are, are important: the interlaminar approach and the transfemoral approach. Uh, I'll talk about the interlaminar approach, um, and and uh, and then the next talk will be uh, transfemoral. Um, this is a. a, a for me, was a was a, a very important approach uh, to to developing my skills in endoscopy. Um, it is a minimal access approach to the lateral spinal canal, uh, typically used in similar situations to an open microdiscectomy. Um, so, from an indication standpoint, I really could understand why to do the operation and that I would technically be able to do it. Uh, the other nice thing that, and I've, I talked to you guys yesterday about this in the lab, is that uh, you can you can definitely open, uh, convert this to open, and that makes it easier and more comfortable as you're learning uh, to recognize that hey, you know, I, it, even if things aren't working out, I, I can always do my traditional operation. So that, that's why. Uh, when I was learning, I actually used this approach more often um, a, a, as opposed to the transfer animal so that I had less likelihood of, of a surgical failure and I could deal with any complications that might arise. Um, so so that, I think that uh, makes it more of the, the crawling or, or maybe early walking approach to endoscopy as opposed to the later on when you start to learn the more complex procedures. <clears throat> Basic indications. Uh, L4, 5, L5, S1, I think, are, are, are the, uh, the best indications, a lateral disc uh, herniation without significant caudal or rostral extension. Uh, thankfully, L5, S1 is, is pretty, pretty darn common, um, and that also increased the likelihood that I'd have cases to do, uh, which is important both from the standpoint of learning, but also from the standpoint of, of uh, acquiring this instrument, instrumentation uh, equipment. Um, there's a cost associated with that, and you don't, you don't want to have, uh, have purchased the capital, taking the capital equipment uh, purchasing costs and then actually not use it. So you really want to make sure that you're using it r routinely uh, as you're learning. Um, uh, equipment, uh, th this uh, endoscopic camera, monitor, irrigation system, fluoroscopy, these are the big things. Um, the, uh, the camera system that I use is actually uh, the same as our uh, arthroscopic and laparoscopic surgeons, so that brings down the cost. Irrigation system uh, is the same as the arthroscopic surgeons, so, so that again brings down the capital acquisition costs in your hospital. Um, room setup is going to be typically, uh, as you've seen in the lab, um, fluoroscopy is going to be opposite to the surgeon. Monitor is going to be opposite to the surgeon, so you have a, a nice, uh, comfortable position to operate. Um, and then uh, endoscope tower and irrigation, typically at the feet, although that can be variable. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, as you've seen, scope setup. Uh, for those of you who use arthroscopes or endoscopes, uh, that is very common. You have the light, light source, uh, camera, and then uh, irrigation. Um, irrigation is, is constant flow irrigation. I typically use anywhere from 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury as my settings, although uh, some, some of the newer, newer pumps will have a constant flow setting as opposed to a constant pressure setting. And, and of course, uh, irrigation is, is your third hand, okay? It's your invisible hand. So this, as you watch this procedure, this is what most common, common question is, uh, aren't, you, aren't you scared you're gonna punch through the dura? Um, and, and certainly when I first saw this, I was too. So I, I, was, I was right there with you, okay? Uh, prone positioning, I uh, typically use a, a three-point bolster table. Um, I, I do not use a Wilson frame. I know that was discussed yesterday. I just make sure that the, the knees are hanging uh, so that we get still some, some lordosis, or excuse me, some kyphosis and, and, and open up those, the interlaminar space a little bit better. Uh, localization is pretty straightforward. Um, we're, we're getting a PA view uh, fluoroscopy, um, and and uh, again, this was another another question that was asked often yesterday: is where are you targeting? You're targeting the interlaminar window. Uh, you can see the the uh, L5 lamina. You see the uh, S1 lamina edge, uh, the, the uh, medial part of the uh, facet joint here, and then the the spinous process here. So. 
if you bisect that line or just go right in the center of this space, that's typically a good starting point. Now, are there variations to this? Yes, but I'm only going to teach you one today, okay? Um, uh, approach, uh, make that skin incision and fascial incision, and then a, a single stage dilator that goes down uh, directly uh, onto the um, ligamentum flavum. Uh, can you move your hands around to, to, um, to uh, feel and palpate uh, bony landmarks? The answer is yes, but the less you do that, the less bleeding you'll have. So, so it's the more direct the approach, uh, the better, and typically try to use fluoro for that, okay? Um, you're gonna be starting outside the, outside the canal, um, and uh, at this point, you're going to place your, your tubular retractor, which is uh, beveled, and we'll talk about what that bevel does for you in a little bit. Um, so uh, six steps, okay, once you get here, it's pretty, pretty uh, short, short work. Um, prepare the ligament, <clears throat> and then what that means is clean off the ligament uh, so, so that you can see it better and so that the, the muscle, muscle tissue and vessels are, are not gonna bleed and cause visualization problems. That's uh, typically one of the big problems that you have is visualization. Uh, so, so getting those, those bleeders before they get you is very helpful. Um, you're gonna traverse the ligament, uh, dissect the nerve, uh, remove the disc, and then check the decompression. Um, so uh, here we are preparing the ligament, uh, of course using a pituitary, uh, um, you can just remove soft tissue. Um, this can be done relatively quickly, you can see there a little bit of bleeders, um, uh, we're using the bipolar cautery to clean up. And then you just want to get a nice, nice sight window of the ligamentum flavum and, and in the cadavers it's a little harder to tell but in, in live patients you're definitely going to see muscle as, as pink and red, uh, fat as yellow and then ligamentum flavum as a nice uh, uh, fibrous texture, uh, fibrous texture and, and you'll be able to tell where, where you're at. Okay, next is traverse the ligamentum flavum and, and this is the part where people get very nervous. Um, uh, and and re because you're using this micro punch, uh, they're they're worried that they're gonna they're gonna come through the ligamentum and then bite the dura. Uh, what typically happens here, and the way this punch is shaped, is it has a blunt lower jaw that is actually sticks out farther than the than the cutting portion. Um, and so you're you're uh, although I'm sure it's technically possible as it is to do anything, the likelihood of, of, of punching the dura is low because you're gonna push that away. But the other thing is, and as we get a little bit farther along in this video. Uh, is that uh, you will um, uh, uh, you will you will uh, pass through the ligamentum and the irrigation will pass through uh, at the same time, which pushes the dura down, pushes it away, and so then you'll see epidural fat, um, and and then you can continue on to open up this this uh, um, the ligamentum and the aperture in the ligament. Okay. Um, and from there, uh, you're going to advance, uh, advance into the canal. Remember, uh, we've talked about that bevel of the working, uh, working port, um, and that, that bevel uh, is facing medially, and it's facing medially so that it will, will uh, give you a good view of the, um, the dura um, uh, because of the angle of the scope facing the same direction, but also it will tend to push the dura and the nerve roots medially. Um, and as long as you're in a good lateral position, that will help you get into a good position when you when you enter the canal. Once you get into the canal, um, you're going to rotate uh, rotate the uh, the bevel to face laterally. And what that does is the tip of the tip of the tubular retractor, tip tip of the working tube, actually acts as a retractor to give you um, uh, to protect the nerve traversing nerve root. <clears throat> So here you can see the ligamentum flavum around the edges of the of the video, um, and uh, and then I'm gradually watching the tip of that um, working uh, port uh, advancing it into the canal. And this is a large disc herniation. Uh, you can see that uh, there's some epidural fat, and then the nerve is actually compressed and very very thinned out uh, in this. So I am, I am altering the view of my scope just to make sure that I can see uh, laterally and make sure I don't uh, pinch a nerve in the lateral uh, aspect or lateral recess. And now you're seeing some epidural fat here. And then we've advanced that, advanced that retractor into the canal. Um, and so uh, the, the, the retractor, or excuse me, the, the tubular retractor, the, the working port is actually uh, fairly small, about seven millimeters. So it's, it's not too much to fit into the canal. And, and uh, the patients, uh, when I do this, are under general anesthesia. So you can manip manipulate the nerve and that's safe. 
Next part is uh, dissecting the nerve. Um, as sometimes there are adhesions on the disc, um, and then also uh, uh, any epidural veins that might bleed, so you want to get those out of the way. And so you can see here I'm using a, a uh, angled uh, kind of nerve hook dissector, and you can use a, a number of different tools to do this. And then once you have that dissected, this is where we make that move to, to rotate or retract the nerve, the traversing nerve root out of the way. And you can see there you're rotating. And so the traversing nerve root is now protected. Okay, so that's, that's what we're uh, seeing now is only disc. Okay, and then the, this part is, uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with this part, but this is the fun part and also the, the easy part. By the time you get here, you've exposed the disc and you're removing disc material. Um, and then after you've removed disc material, of course, you want to check your decompression. There's um, uh, three, three points. One is to make sure that you've actually removed the target uh, disc. So what you see on the scan, uh, you want to make sure you, you, you've identified and targeted that disc. Um, the, the second point is seeing uh, pulsations of the nerve, um, and I think that's, that can be uh, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, once you get used to this, you can see it more regularly and routinely, but I think that's an, another important point. And then the other one is just doing as you normally would, palpating under the nerve, feeling for any additional disc material um, there. Okay, and then, uh, Importantly, and you probably notice this, the endoscopic view is two-dimensional, so you have a loss of depth perception, but because the, the scopes are angled, you, you typically can see a lot more than normal uh, in a normal operation, microscopic operation. If you rotate the scope, you can see around uh, your tool, see around it and see what, it's, what, what the tool is doing uh, from, from one side or the other, which is very, very beneficial. And that's it. Okay, so after you do that, make sure there's no bleeding and, and out you come, okay? Um, uh, I, I do want to, I do have a confession to make. That was my very first operation that I ever did. So I want you guys to know that that was, that was the, 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 the case and the view and all those things were the, the very first time that I ever did the, the endoscopic approach. That was many years ago, but, but I think what you can see as you, as you practice and develop your skills is that it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it is a little daunting at first, uh, but, but pretty straightforward. So um, limitations of the interlaminar approach it requires more drilling at the upper levels of the spine. Um, redo surgery is difficult because of some of the distorted anatomy, although I, uh, later on in, in, my, in my development of these skills, I've, I've certainly done redo operations with, with the endoscope. Um, migrated disc, discs can be difficult, um, and then the angle of the approach, the disc space, makes it difficult to remove disc uh, within the disc space. So you, sometimes it's hard to get deep within the disc space, which is not a common thing we do with the endoscope, but certainly in open procedures and, and, and revisions with large, large disc herniations and things like that, sometimes we'll Will, will want to do that. So, um, in conclusion, uh, the interlaminar full endoscopic discectomy is an effective, uh, reproducible, minimally invasive approach to remove disc pathology, um, and of course, a, a good starter case to learn uh, uh, safely uh, how to use the spine endoscope. Um, and, and because you have uh, a lot of co common pathology to work on uh, when you when you start to acquire your skills. So, thank you very much. Um, do we have time for a little bit more? I like five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip. We've gotten a lot of data, although the the data is good. Uh, the Dutch study uh, that that everybody's been referencing is really interesting because within that Dutch study, they actually only had one expert endoscopist. Um, and the other ones that were part of the study actually were learning in the midst of the study. So they actually took uh, 50 cases per uh, surgeon and actually, so, so this had good outcomes even though people were learning in the middle of the study. So I, I think that's a really important point about this study. Um, and of course all the other things about complications and uh, cost effectiveness. So, uh, how do you start learning uh, endoscopic uh, procedures? The, the, this is going to be a quick three minutes, okay? Uh, maintain appropriate indications. So the same indications that you'd normally use for doing a, doing a discectomy or a decompression, you want to use those same indications. 
you, when you acquire new technology, it should be uh, at least as good as the alternative, uh, both technically and from an outcome perspective. So um, although we didn't have as much outcome information when I started, uh, from a technical perspective, I felt that, that, this, that the endoscope was going to do the same job. I, I, um, I'm a neurosurgeon, so I was doing an endoscopic third ventric ventriculostomy when I had this aha moment that this is much harder than, than, than doing a disc, so uh, we, we probably can do it. So um, that's important. Um, the equipment, uh, the cost, so the cost for the equipment and the opportunity cost should be not be too significantly different from, from doing your traditional operation. So that's where, when you see that was my very first case, of course it's edited down, but it um, uh, amazingly w went very, very quickly and I was, I was quite shocked by that. So, so you, I didn't lose much uh, as far as timing and operations and things like that, um, even though as I, as I advanced in the difficulties, sometimes cases did take longer. Um, the ideal technology also needs to be general, generalizable. So um, one, one of the biggest pushbacks I got from, from my colleagues was how many, how many foraminal discs are there? You're not going to use that. You're not going to use this technology that often. And that was the reason that, that, I, that I, the interlaminar approach also became important for me is that I would be using that technology more, more commonly. <clears throat> and, and then, of course, study your results, which we're all trying to do now. Um, transitioning from open to endos endoscopic, you guys are already starting that process by showing up at a training course and getting your hands on it. Um, but you're going to go to more than one course, certainly, and then and then also specifically get involved in uh, one or two cases, uh, case types that are really going to give you a high yield. <clears throat> Um, when I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to get proctored, but if you can, that of course is going to make it a lot easier. Um, and then I also discussed with the patients the, the concept of doing the endoscopy and also converting to open. So I always had a plan A and plan B, and that made it easier to, to uh, and, and also with my surgical team, made it easier to just uh, go get right in there and get working. Um, get comfortable. Um, the endoscope is a little bit harder to manipulate and hold uh, at first. You can get yourself stressed out. And, and, and kind of rush through things just because you're uncomfortable. So be careful with that. Give yourself more time and then always define the anatomy. So these are imp all important things. Um, training uh, requires practice, which can sometimes be models, simulators, and videos. Um, scrimmage is using cadavers, so that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, and then game time is a real operation. So you don't really want to be learning uh, too much at the time of the operation. Um, and this is a kind of fun little uh, box trainer that I actually have my daughter using. Uh, bought the endoscope off of Amazon, um, and uh, and you can you can create a little a little. Uh, maze or game to work with your endoscope so you can get your hand skills better. Um, and, and that is cheap and inexpensive, right? So, so you, you, you'll see a lot of similarities just working through cotton balls. Um, and then the targets are these little straws as you go through. So um, yeah, so, so that, those kinds of things are, are ways that you can start the process of learning, getting your hand skills, getting used to the 2D aspect of these things uh, without, without having to spend a lot of money also. So. Thank you, everybody, for your time, and thanks a lot. Fan, that was a great talk. Um, I, I a quick question. I, I think you mentioned that um, <clears throat> you don't use the Wilson frame. Is there a particular reason why you prefer not the Wilson frame? I'm just, just curious. So the main reason is uh, trying to keep everything straightforward for the operating room. The less changes I have to make, the easier it is. So, so Ray and I were just having this discussion. The more you do things the same, uh, the less the, the easier it is as far as the flow of the day. The easier it is for your for your um, for the the techs and the nurses. Um, I I uh, certainly you know the Wilson frame has some value. I think. But at the same time, since I, I was getting the same results just using a, the three-point bolsters, I felt like I didn't have to add that uh, level of complexity. And, and of course, seeing how many other people do it throughout the world, you know, there's a lot of variation. You can do it simply with bolsters on a table. They're, they're, you know, we don't have to get too complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Main thing. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, thanks for the talk. One quick question. Uh, I think before the audience, we should really clarify and discuss the, the use of pumps of yep. irrigation. Uh, so uh, there is different ways to bring irrigation into the field. Uh, the reason why it is important, it's obviously we have to want to control the pressure. Typically, the pressure shouldn't be more than the diastolic pressure. Yep. That's kind of the rule of thumb. 
but then it also depends on what area of the spine you operate on. So the cervical spine and thoracic spine is obviously much more sensitive to that. Right. So there's flow controlled ones, right? There's pressure controlled ones. The ones that we have here in the lab are pressure controlled, and then some right. people use gravity. Right. Right. And so, uh, so tell us a little bit about what your setup is, and, and and you know what the novice as well as us, you know, we have to be careful of. Uh, obviously, we're worried about you know fluid tracking. That's one big issue with cervical yep. thoracic. And then the, that's the biggest issue of bipodal technique, right? Because you have to have so much irrigation and fluid uh, that can track. So the first thing we'll, I want to talk about is, yes, we use constant flow irrigation, but you need, an, obviously, inflow, but you also need um, very safe outflow, OK? So, so that, that's what keeps you most safe in these operations, even though the pressure settings are important, too. Um, if, 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 you're, if your system has an easily obstructed outflow, that can be quite dangerous, because you can overpressurize. Uh, within the epidural space. The reason that's a concern, uh, overpressurizing can cause uh, seizures, can cause death, and, has, and that has been reported. To, so um, different systems have different outflows, um, and, and um, you just want to make sure that they do have an outflow and that you understand when that system is not functioning right, that you can, you can recognize it and, and make sure that that's gonna, their patient's going to be safe. Um, the, there's there's um, pressure control, which are, are um, very commonly like arthroscopic type pumps, um, and those will, will control by pressure um, and can have a pressure setting. And, a, and like I said, somewhere between 35 and 45 has worked reasonably well. Uh, variations on that is flow control, meaning the, the, the pressure is maintained constant. But if there's any kind of change in the obstruction or change in the in instrumentation or equipment that you're using, uh, the pump will change the flow rate so you still get kind of the constant amount of fluid moving through the system. Um, it actually is very nice, uh, looks very good, but it, it is a much more technologically uh, advanced um, system, uh, requires uh, um, uh, calibrating with different different size uh, working ports and things like that. So, so a little bit more sophisticated uh, can be more cost, costly. Um, and then gravity uh, is, is commonly used um, and, and can be also be done safely. And, and certainly there are surgeons. And gravity is simply just hanging hanging irrigation from a from an IV pole. So that's that's the less expensive way. Uh, it, it sometimes can get a lot more wet a lot faster. That's kind of typically why the pumps are used. So hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. So our next talk is. Uh...